Hey, welcome to another edition of our online worship experience. My name is Jason. It is so great to be with you. If it's Happy Sunday or whenever you may be watching and sharing in this experience with us. And, and I pray for that worship experience for you. Let me share a couple of things just as we we begin here to emphasize, first of all, just real action, real application from what we're talking about here in the Word, and, and also real relationships, that, that where you are could be an opportunity to build relationships that if you are not in the room with us on Sunday morning, think about taking this experience of being in God's Word, having worship where you are, and we believe where God is at work, relationships will be happening in your living room, back porch, coffee shop, wherever that might be. Think about how you could create a worship experience right where you are inviting people into this moment for real relationships and, and true life, real life application as what we're doing here hopefully will change lives, that it's not just information but it is about God doing a work in and through us that brings about change and transformation. And so we're excited to share these moments with you. Uh, in the room, in person happens right here where I am sitting in this room. This is our downstairs worship area on the campus of First Baptist in Fort Overthorpe. 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings in the room. We would love to invite you into that room experience. But also, let me share this. Here's some really good news that on Sunday, beginning Sunday, April the 3rd, just in a few weeks, beginning in April here in 2022, we will be live streaming what we're doing here in the moment uh, and, and what we do on Sunday mornings live in that moment. Uh, we will be able to allow you to be able to live stream that and share during the 11 o'clock hour on Sunday morning. So stay tuned for those exciting things coming your way very soon. Let me introduce this new series right now by turning your attention to the video you're about to see. help define us. Some are descriptions. Some are titles. But the reason for so many names is that the Bible is meant to reveal who God is. To show us what He is like. and teach us what he has done. But the name, which is above every name, is the name of Jesus. That video encourages us to answer and really consider this deeper question, who do you say that Jesus is? I wanna welcome you to this new series and we are going after that question and here's why, here's the importance of it because we live in a time where so many of us have heard the name of Jesus. Now, that may not be true in some of the farthest reaches of the world. Uh, that is a subject of missions for another time. That's a big deal. But think about the context in which you are living, that most people have at least heard the name of Jesus. And when that happens, it automatically creates a tendency. And it's a tendency that you have and that I have, and it is to label Jesus or to define him the way that we want to define him. And usually that means 
bringing him down to our level in a way where he meets our expectations and he meets our conveniences. And if that's happening for you, and it's a tendency that happens for all of us, here's the thing, you're gonna miss the answer to that fundamental, most life-changing, destiny-defining question. Jesus asked the question beginning in Matthew 16, where he said with eight simple words, really in the Greek language, he was using six words, but eight words here in English, but who do you? And that's emphasized, who do you say that I am? And beginning with that question, there have always been so many opinions. Just think about the many opinions about who we would say and who others are saying that Jesus is. Some of us would try to label him as a teacher, Maybe we would label him as a healer or a nice guy, a good person. Maybe we might label him as the leader of a very devoted small group. And some of those followers were even willing to make up stories about him coming back to life after his death. There are so many, uh, there's so many, a variety of opinions on who you say that Jesus is, who others are saying that Jesus is. And I want you to see this. No matter how you answer the question, you are taking a step of faith. Think about that. No matter how you answer the question, and it is a life-changing question, it's such an important question, but how you answer it is always going to be a matter of faith. Even to this point, even if you don't answer the question, the, the, the absence of an answer really is an answer, if you think about it, which will require a step of faith. Now, here's the good news. Just as we saw in the video, God wants you to know. Through his word, God wants you to know who Jesus really is. And this series is all about getting to the heart of him so that you have clarity and you have confidence on God's level at who Jesus and what he is all about, who he is. And our focus in this series is going to be on the three predictions that Jesus gives to us in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We would call Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synoptic gospels. They give this synopsis, this comprehensive overview of the life of Jesus on earth. And three times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, at big, three big defining moments in who Jesus is, each time Jesus pauses the action in what is happening to give a prediction of how he was going to die. Each one of these predictions in context will help us better understand on God's terms who Jesus really is. We want you to have clarity about that and confidence about answering that life-changing question. And we begin today with death prediction of Jesus number one. Our text is gonna be Matthew 16. So as you're getting settled in, Find Matthew 16, and we're going to begin with death prediction number one, beginning in verse 21. Here in verse 21, Jesus is speaking to those closest followers. And by the way, one of them named Peter had identified Jesus as the Messiah, saying, Jesus, you are the promised Messiah, the Christ. But after that big announcement, that big identification in the life of Jesus, we read this in verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must, he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and even be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter, the same Peter that said, you're Messiah, the same Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Let's pause here for prayer as we bow our heads. Father, first of all, Bless the reading of your word. And as we see here, Jesus being very direct, very direct in this relationship that he had 
with his closest followers. I pray that Jesus would be speaking now. For those of us who have heard his name, for those of us who have drawn different conclusions, opinions about who he is, that here is Jesus speaking into our lives from his word that we get that question right. Who do we say that Jesus really is? We pray this in his name right now. Amen. And so think about for Peter to go from that mountaintop experience of getting the question right, Jesus, you are Messiah, to suddenly being in this moment responding to that death prediction. I would call it a moment of tremendous humility. I remember this, one of my most humbling moments. Think about one of your most humbling moments. Moments. It was around 8.15 on a Monday morning at the beginning of a school semester. Let's just say that coming out of undergrad that I had tremendous confidence. I was overly confident. I had done so well in undergraduate getting my degree at UT Chattanooga that when I stepped into law school, let's just say that I was overly confident. Some of the upperclassmen had, had warned us. They had warned a few, a few of us before classes started. They say, look, you need to be ready. This will be different than undergrad. When you step in to this law school experience, even on day one, class one, you've got to be ready. But in my mind, I'm like, man, I got this, right? I know what I'm doing as a student, no problem. And by the way, even if they begin calling on people in this class day one, man, my last name begins with a T. I, I have nothing to worry about until about 8.15 that very first Monday morning. For some reason, like that professor, he didn't have B through S in his alphabet. He went right from A to the letter T and began calling on me that Monday morning. And it was a Monday morning when, let's just be honest, I was not ready. All of that confidence and that built up esteem that I had, most of it being false, right? I had this overconfidence, this sense of arrogance about me going into that situation. Let's just say that in that moment, I was practically crawling up under my desk. That it brought me so low that I was like, never will I be overconfident and take this for granted again. One of those moments of being up on the high, being brought down to the low. And that, that's Peter here as we dive into Matthew 16. What was the real issue with Peter? What, what was he so confident about? And I would say it has everything to do with this. His own selfish expectations. That he had correctly said, Jesus, you are Messiah. But then he did not understand what it meant for Jesus to truly be Messiah. Here's what Messiah means. It comes from the Hebrew word Massah, which means to be anointed. And going back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, God had promised that he would anoint a future king in the line of David, and this would be a king chosen by God who would be even greater, an eternal king, a forever king on the throne of David, but he would be even greater than David. And so Jesus being that anointed king, Peter was right when he said, you are that king, but here's the problem. There were so many different human expectations on what kind of king Jesus would be. And so what Peter had to learn the hard way, Jesus makes it more gentle for us to understand that he is the king of kings. But what kind of Messiah king is he really going to be? What kind of king? We see, first of all, as we dive into this first prediction that Jesus is king who would be, first of all, faithful to the point of physical death. Faithful to the point of physical death. Death. Let's read together verse 21. From that time, meaning he is the Messiah King, there's a turning point. From that time mark, marks a turning point. Jesus began to show those closest followers that he must go. There was this faithfulness, a determination. He must go to Jerusalem 
and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, the Jewish leadership there, and even be killed to give up his physical life, but on the third day be raised up. So this turning point, Jesus, you are king, launches a turning point towards Jerusalem. But Jesus was turning them there already knowing what was waiting for him in Jerusalem. That there was this reality that there in Jerusalem he would physically die. Now, now people have asked, when did Jesus know that? At what point in his life? And I would say he always knew. And here's where I would make that conclusion. If you go back to this point in Genesis 2, 17. Think about it for a moment. Jesus, the Son of God. Now, Jesus did come into this earth to live 33 years, taking on flesh, taking the name Jesus. But he has always existed as the second person of the Trinity. He is the Son of God. He is God the Son. He always has been. Now, we go back to Genesis 2, 17, where God made this warning, this ancient warning to the first human being. Genesis 2, 17 goes like this. God says, listen, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you do that, then you will what? Surely die. Now, think about what that sets up, that God is good. And that humanity was one with God. We, were, we weren't God. We were created by God, but we had a tight relationship with God. We were, in a sense, united. We were in a close relationship with him. But God says, if you step outside of that, if you disobey me, then the very act of disobeying, if God is good, the opposite of God is evil. And the knowledge of good and evil would be this. If you disobey me for the first time, you will know evil because the very act of choosing to disobey God would be evil. You're going to experience evil and you're going to know it because now you're experiencing it because you're doing it. You will have separated yourself from God. Now think about this. The separation from the giver of life results in the opposite of life, which is death. And God gives that ancient warning in Genesis 2, 17 of saying, you step away from me, you're stepping into evil and you're stepping ultimately into the consequence of death. But even as God said, you will surely die, the Son of God is there knowing that the death that would be of most significance to God would be his own. Jesus knew from the beginning that it would be his own death. Why? Because the plan of God in his grace, even going back to Genesis 2 and 3, they didn't surely die immediately, that God in his grace actually began to provide a substitute. Ultimately, Jesus would be that substitute. And here's the plan, that Jesus would come, he would leave his throne, he would leave heaven to come to earth to live a life without evil. He was always united with God. He never disobeyed God. There was never evil. He never stepped into evil. He stepped in a world of evil, but he never actually committed the evil. He never sinned so that when he laid his life down, he was that dead. You will surely die was pointing to Jesus, the Son of God. That he would die as that substitute so that by dying for sin, when he had not sinned, he's dying for mine. He's dying for yours. He becomes that perfect sacrifice. And, and so you see Jesus, he's committed to that knowing that even as he left heaven, he was part of this plan that he would be the one to surely die. Now think about this for a moment. What kind of king would leave his throne coming to earth already knowing that by stepping into flesh, taking on flesh, coming to earth, he was putting his life right under the very shadow of physical death. Think about what that tells us. The commitment to physical death tells us about what kind of king Jesus really is. Let me, let me position it this way. If you knew getting into that car or getting on board that plane that it surely was going to crash and would take you to your grave, would you actually get in the car that day? Would you get on board the airplane in that instance if you knew where it was headed. And yet, 
Jesus came from heaven to earth, a king giving up his throne, leaving heaven, knowing that he would surely die. In your personal time or your group time, think deeply about that. What does that tell us about who Jesus is as a king? In this death prediction, a king who would be faithful even to the point, even to the point of physical death. It's, it's really an amazing thing that teaches us about who Jesus really is. But also this, prediction of death teaches us this also, truth number two. Not only that Jesus is king, faithful to death, but he is a king that is faithful to the point of human disagreement. He's a king that is faithful even to the point of human disagreement. Let me explain what I mean by that. Look at verse 22. Peter took him aside and said, no way. And he began to actually rebuke him, meaning to correct him, to intercede, and to say, no, this isn't going to happen to you. Far be it from you. As far away from you as possible, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Now, here's Peter stepping up to be a protector against the prediction that this will never happen. Far be it from you, Lord, this will not happen to you. But I would ask the question, what is Peter really trying to protect? Think about his own expectations. This is Peter saying, Jesus, you are king. Yes, you're Messiah, but you're my king. And you're my king that needs to match my own expectations. I want you to be my king on my terms. And my terms are this. You need to be physically strong. You need to be physically victorious. We want you to be an earthly king. I want the benefits of you being a king. And in their context, many of those closest followers of Jesus would hijack Jesus on their terms to say, yeah, you be king for us the way we want you to be. We want to be as Israel liberated from Rome and the occupation of the Roman government in their day. Jesus, be our king, but be our king on our terms. And so think about Jesus stepping into this. He already knew the prediction would draw sharp disagreement from his own closest followers, they would not understand and they would not like Jesus saying, yes, I'm king, but I'm going to lay my life down for you. What kind of king would be willing to say, even when I don't match your expectations, this is the kind of king that I am going to be. Now, for you and I, who, who we don't like conflict and if we're very easygoing and we want everyone to like us and we want to please everybody. If Jesus had been that way, he might have said, now, Peter, I know you're not going to like this, but, but maybe I don't even need to tell you this. I'm afraid to tell you this. Maybe I shouldn't tell you this. You can just imagine how, how Jesus might would have tried to soft pedal this moment of trying to tell them, listen, I know you're not going to understand, but listen, you got to hear, I mean, how Jesus might have pleaded with them. But no, the matter of fact of a king who would say, I'm going to die. This is Jesus saying, I'm telling you this, even if you don't like it. I'm telling you this, even if it brings about human disagreement. Why? Because here's a turning point. Jesus is saying, it's now time. I'm taking the relationship back onto my terms. You need to see me on my terms. This isn't about your expectations. It's about Jesus being true to who he is in the mission of his life, even if it brought about human disagreement. And just, and just think about that for a moment, that Jesus would say, I am interrupting how you think I am, who you say I am, to show you who I really am. This is a place for you and I to think about how we tend to, kind of like Peter, we want to bring down Jesus to our level. I mean, just look how silly that looked for Peter to be the one trying to step up to rebuke Jesus, to bring Jesus down to his level as if Peter knew better as if Peter was in control when Jesus says, ultimately, I'm taking back the control. The relationship has to be on Jesus' terms, not Peter's terms. But here's the thing. If we're honest, you and I, 
Very often we make the same kind of mistakes. We want Jesus to fit our lifestyles. We want Jesus to do for us what we want. And and here's, let me give you some examples how we're guilty of that. When we say, Jesus, I want your grace and your love, but not the discipline. I don't really want to obey you. I don't want to change. I don't want you to change my life. I just want you to give me a pass into heaven. So if you treat Jesus as a ticket to heaven, but there's really no relationship where you're growing in your walk with him, then what you have done is you brought Jesus down to you. You want Jesus to come alongside you rather than you alongside him. And Jesus says, I don't mind disagreeing with you. Jesus says, I don't mind getting in your face to say, even if you don't like it, that is not the true understanding of Jesus. He will correct you. He doesn't mind the disagreement. If he's a king, then it's about his authority. And he says, you need to align with me, not me aligning with you. Or what about those of us, especially as church, that we would say, well, we're going to make our plans and we're going to do what we want to do. And we just hope that Jesus blesses it right? Let's just be what we want. I'm going to do what I want to do. The ministries I want to do, and I just hope Jesus blesses it. That is us guilty of trying to bring Jesus down to our level rather than us to him. And so think about in your personal time or your group time, how it's so easy for us as human beings to have that tendency to say, man, I I want to define Jesus based on my own comforts my own expectations. And, and, and if he's going to say something I don't like, if I'm going to read something in his word that I don't like, then I'm going to ignore that. And I want to keep Jesus on my terms. Think about how Jesus will intercede. Just as he did here, death prediction sets up this reality that yes, Jesus is king, but not on your terms. He is king even to the point, faithful to the point, of human disagreement. He'll disagree with you to bring you alongside where he is rather than you trying to bring him down to your level. That's a big deal. That's a big thing for us to think about this week. Jesus is king, faithful to the point of human disagreement. But what about this final point? This final important thing we see and learn about Jesus. This death prediction teaches us that Jesus is king, faithful, yes to death, faithful even to the point of human disagreement, but ultimately his faithfulness is to the point of godly devotion. Godly devotion. Why is Jesus so faithful here to even death, even disagreement? This gets down to the final point, number three, and we see this in verse 23. But Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me. Get out of my way, Satan. That's heavy, isn't it? You are a hindrance to me. For you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. In other words, Jesus is saying, Peter, right here, you are trying to get in the way of the will of God. Jesus had his mind on God's plan, the things of God. Peter, you're just thinking about the things of humanity, the things of earth, worldly things, rather than the will of God. This is Jesus saying that he is totally committed to the will of God. You you ask the question, why did Jesus have to die? Why was he committed to death? Why was he even willing to stir things up and bring about sharp disagreement? Well, part of it is, yes, you might answer the question, well, Jesus loves me. Yeah, he does love you, and he did those things in love for you, but ultimately, he did these things in faithfulness to the Father. Jesus is king who is faithful to the point of godly devotion. This is Jesus saying here, I am all about the will of God. And it's so amazing how this goes back perfectly to another death prediction in Isaiah 53. Speaking of the suffering Messiah, Isaiah 53, 10, we read, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. And when his soul makes an offering for guilt, 
he shall see his offspring, which we know to be those who follow him, who are saved by him, the church. He shall see his offspring and he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Think about what that's predicting and what that's saying is that it would be the will of God, the plans of God that would bring about ultimately the death and resurrection of Jesus, of the suffering Messiah. And so Jesus is saying, I'm completely faithful and surrendered to the will of God. And think about how that, how that had to be, right? Theologically, Jesus never sinned. So he was totally faithful even when that faithfulness meant a risk of disagreement and ultimately the giving up of his physical life. Jesus was ultimately faithful. And here's the thing we need to think about. When he's faithful to the will of God, anything that would come along, anything or anyone who would come along to derail, to interfere with, like Peter here, Jesus says, listen, you're no longer about the will of God. You are the opposite of God. And Jesus would say, if you are interfering with the mission, his mission, then you're no better than what Satan tried to do back in Matthew 4 when Satan came to meet Jesus in the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry. It was Satan trying to derail the mission of God. Now, this is a big deal because what... Uh, Jesus is saying here is, Peter, you are not about the will of God. You brought this down to your level. You're about the things of yourself, the things of this world. You are no better. You are in essence doing the work of Satan. And, and sadly for Peter, this rebuke of Jesus basically says, Peter, you were the building block. Back when you announced that I'm Messiah, your very name as Peter, the building block has suddenly become the stumbling block. The word hindrance there in verse 23 is the word scandalon, which we get the word scandalous, but ultimately the Greek, it means you become the stumbling block. It, it really challenges us to think about as we are right here reading these words, what kind of rock are we when it comes to the things of God? Are, are we the building block or are we the stumbling block. And here's the harsh reality. Here's the hard truth. If we are interfering with the will of God, the mission of God, then we're no better than Peter. If your life or your church is not advancing the mission of God, if you are interfering with the mission of God, then you're the stumbling block. And Jesus is, is essentially rebuking here saying, you are no better than Satan himself if you are not about advancing and being in line with the will of God. Now, I don't know about you, but that kind of calling out is the kind of thing that should keep us up at night. Think about your life. Think about our church. Are we interfering with the mission and the will of God? How easy it is when we bring Jesus down to our human level and we don't answer the question correctly. We, we answer his identity. We answer what we think about. We label Jesus based on how we want to label him. Jesus calls us out here and says, listen, we need to get this right. If we don't, if we are interfering with who he really is, then we're no better than Peter. We're no better than Satan himself. Man, that's a big deal. I would encourage you to, to think about that and, and allow God to call you out, to call us out as a church on that very thing. And it really brings us to the, the bigger question. And here's where we're going to land today. And I encourage you, just as I'm going to do this week, think about this. What does it say for God to send Jesus from heaven to earth, to send him to be the king, the king of kings, who would be faithful to the point of this death prediction? What does it teach us, not only about who Jesus is, but about us and our greatest need in this life.
I don't know if you've been watching the news, but, but a few weeks ago when Russia began that brutal attack, that brutal attack on Ukraine, the, the Ukrainian president said, he said this to the press, he said, listen, what I need right now, I don't need a ride out of here. What I need are the right weapons so that we can defend ourselves. And so I loved that answer that he's trying to think about what do we really need? Now, in light of what we've just read, I would take it to an even higher level as we see world politics and leaders, especially uh, leaders of some of these big nations, some of these powerful nations. We see these leaders that aren't sure how to lead. And, and in a sense, we're all in one world and, and we're all kind of on the same playing field as world powers. And you see the leaders that are afraid to, that we're afraid we're gonna push right? The wrong button. We're afraid we're going to make the wrong move. And, and, and I know I'm, I'm saying this knowing with humility, the stakes are incredibly high. But I would say, don't you think about this? Think, think about this. Don't you think it, it suggests that we need a king who really is of an even higher authority? When you think about the condition of the world, doesn't it point to the need of a king who truly is the king of kings. If I asked you, why would God send a king who would be willing to lay his life down? What does that say about the world and about you and me and the greatest needs that we have as humanity, as the creation of God? His death in your place brings you into that relationship with the one who is the Lord, who is the true king of kings. And that's what we need. We need his authority. We need his power. He is the one who's created the entire world. And so, listen to me. If you're looking to this, if, if you're looking for religion as a crutch or you're looking for church as an entertainment, God did not send an entertainer. If you're looking for a politician or a leader, God didn't send into this world just another politician. Listen, God sent Jesus the King of Kings, who is faithful to the point, so faithful to the plan and mission of God that he was willing to lay down his life. Think about what that means for you and I today as hopefully we look with clarity to him. Pray with me in this moment. Father, I pray that we would think about uh, Lord, as we, we come to the end of this first prediction and what it teaches us about Jesus and this declaration that he is king, but he's a king faithful to death. He's a king faithful even to the point of disagreement, faithful ultimately to you, Father. How does that speak in to our lives today and how maybe we have been guilty of bringing Jesus down to our level. Maybe in some way we've been the stumbling block that, that we've made that mistake of reducing Jesus to just what we would want him to be. To meet our needs, to, to meet our conveniences. And here's Jesus waking us up, calling us out of that. Even calling us to a place of the challenge of how can we be a building block for him? for his mission. Father, I pray that hope, I pray that opportunity that even in this moment that you would challenge our hearts by what Jesus says here, speaking into our lives and maybe for the first time we're seeing him as who he really is, the King of Kings. Your word tells us that one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Lord, I pray that that would begin right now for each one of us in our personal lives. We need a king. We need this benevolent king who would, who would give up his life for us to save us, to rescue us, and through him to bring us into this relationship of his lordship, to follow him, to surrender to him now, and to trust him to follow him now with our lives. I pray, Lord, that you would take us by the hand in this. All these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, hey thanks for the opportunity. 
And, and I know a message like this, as we begin to dig in to some of these deeper points of who Jesus is, it may raise questions. Why did Jesus say this? Why did he do that? And, and what do you see here when you read Matthew 16? If you have questions, here's what we wanna do. We wanna answer those questions. We wanna help you find answers yourself in God's word. And ultimately we want to help equip you to be about following him and maybe becoming that leader who helps others to follow him. So stay tuned at the end of our time together, just here in a moment. And there are ways for you to get to know us and to build that relationship so that we can pour into you as you turn your life to following him. Thank you again. Until we share this moment again, God bless you.